of Jesus right there. Because you have the blue as heaven above, you have the purple as royalty, which would show his deity and his royalness, and, and, and he was and that, and the scarlet would be the blood of the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can see, just uh, visually even right now, you can see that all three things are present right there as a descriptive story just before the presence of God. Where only one was allowed. And, uh, and a thought, as I've been studying for this, and, and uh, the thought came to me how awesome that this really is and how really that it is a picture of Jesus Christ in a literal sense. More than just represented in the colors of the story right there that he comes from above, he's royal and he's a sacrifice, you have to go through the veil to get to God. No man cometh unto the Father but by me, by is through. You have to go through Jesus Christ in order to get to the presence of God. He stands between man and God to allow passage. Nobody gets to the presence of God without going through Jesus Christ. Amen. And it's a powerful thing when you really look at that. It's like standing before the Lord Jesus Christ before you even get into the presence of Jehovah. Right there in the, in the, in the front part of that. So just in the description alone is exciting enough. I mean, it's, it's awesome uh, to, to have uh, the Lord set that up like that and then we know, uh, we know what it is and we can see what it is. And, you know, really everything in the tabernacle was meant to point to there is only going to be one sacrifice and then it's, it's going to open it up for everybody. Everything is meant and pushed that way. So you have to go through the veil in order to get. And we'll be talking to, uh, to, uh, next week is our last one. It'll be the mercy seat, which is very, very important. Uh, and we'll talk about that more next week, of course. That's what the lesson will be on, and that will wrap up our tabernacle or, uh, series that we're doing here. But uh, also, there was that fine twine linen of cunning work. It's the righteousness. Our Lord was the fullness of the Godhead bodily. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. One God manifesting Himself in three persons, and these three co-equal in all attributes and power. All right, they all have the same power. All right, but it's it's presenting in three different kind of offices, and they're all co-equal. And and I want you to notice it was to be hung. It was to be hung up. It was to be hung up. That's Calvary. Our Lord hung upon a wooden cross covered with the work of deity with four sockets of silver, a beautiful type of redemption. He hung. He was up. If I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. He was already talking about that. Okay? Then he said, it shall divide. It was talking about how it divides. Uh, our Lord, the Apostle, like we talked about last time, was He represents God to us and a high priest. He, rep he represents us to God of our profession. So let's talk about, for a few minutes, let's talk about the importance of the veil. I want to say it right in the right way. But the veil was a buffer. It separated the sinfulness of man from the all-consuming holiness of God. All right, it, it separated it. It was it was the divider. Uh, the Old Testament veil was symbolic of Jesus Christ to come. At Calvary, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, showing that the way into the holy of holies was opened up through the rending of the body. See, his body was torn. His body was torn on that tree. And isn't it something that his, his body was torn and rent 
on the cross and the veil was rent in the tabernacle from the top to the bottom. Isn't that something? I want to go also over to uh, Exodus chapter 33. Let's read a few verses over there. Exodus chapter 33, verses 18. Uh, God do verse 23. In verse 18 of chapter 33, and he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. Now this is Moses uh, uh, meeting the Lord. He said, I will make uh, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me. Boy, we could just stop right there, couldn't we? Couldn't we just stop right there for a second? God said, There is a place by me. Okay? And thou shalt stand upon a rock. And it shall come to pass, while my glory passeth by, that I will put thee in the cliff of the rock, and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. And I will take away mine hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. Picture it in your mind. I like to I like to jump in here. Look, this is where you jump into the story. This is where you jump in to the Bible. You jump in here. You picture in your mind a mountain. You picture that he's up there with God for the tabernacle, for the tablets. He's there to get the next round of tablets after the ones the first round was broken. God says, okay. Basically, Moses is saying, let me see you. You got to understand, God loves everybody. But Moses was special. Out of all the characters in the Bible that you read about, there's nobody like Moses. The way that God interacted with Moses. And... Uh, so, and you know, when he when he reamed Mary him out for complaining against Moses, he said, Other prophets I speak to in dreams, but my servant Moses I speak with face to face. So Moses said, Let me see you while he's up there. And God says, I can't let you see my face. Because no flesh can see my face and live. You just think about that. <clears throat> Let that sink in. Let it marinate. No flesh can look on the face of the Lord God Jehovah and live. You couldn't even live. You would die instantly. But he says, this is what I'm going to do. This is how much he loved Moses. You don't find any other interaction in the Bible with anyone else other than Moses. He says, here's what I'm going to... Don't you love how God tells you what he's going to do before he does it? He said, here's the plan. There's a place by me. On this mountain. You're going to stand on a rock. I'm going to put you on that rock and cover you with my hand while I pass by. Then I'm going to remove my hand and you'll be able to see the back of me. You can't see my face because you won't live. But you will see. Nobody else that I find in the Bible ever got a look at Jehovah. Any part. 
said, that's what's going to happen. I'm going to cover you with my hand to protect you while I pass by. And I'm going to remove my hand and you'll see the back. You don't find that anywhere else. You don't find that anywhere else. And before I go on, Pastor and I have often talked about how Moses died. And, uh, and, and he, it was his, and because he loved Moses so much, Pastor always said, I just think that when he when he went up, when it was time to show him the Can Canaan land a long time down the road after this, that he just wrapped his arms around him and loved him to death. But I have a, I have a theory. I have a theory. Because with this in mind that no man could see my face and live, I find where Moses died right after the Lord said, you shall not cross over. You know what I think he did? I think the Lord God Put his face when he said that word. I think he he wanted Moses to see him. Because no man could see my face and live, and we're not told how he died. But we know he died after he heard the word of the Lord. And he was in the presence of God. And I also find out where God took him and buried him. over in the valley near Moab. I think he just leaned down and said, but you are not going to cross over. And Moses died. There was no other conversation after that. And then he picked him up. And God himself buried him. You don't find that with Abraham. You don't find that with Isaac or Jacob or anybody else. Where God spoke to Moses, that's how much he loves his people. Moses was chosen to go deliver God's people. And that's how much God loved Moses. Loved him. I don't find anybody else that got personal burial by the Lord God. What, what verse is that? Oh, where he uh, died instantly? Oh, where, he or, where he buried him? Oh, that I believe, I didn't write down the, I didn't write down, I'll get it for you after because I have it on my phone. I'll look it up. But uh, Just it's right where they, um, I believe it's in Deuteronomy where, the, where he died. Right there, right toward the end, just before, uh, where it'll show you. As a matter of fact, you know what? Let's just let's just take a minute. If we go over to Deuteronomy. Sorry, Matt, this is not on the. This was not on the schedule. Moses, <laughs> right here. Okay. So in verse 4 of chapter 34, it says, And the Lord said unto him, talking about Moses, This is the land which I swear unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, saying, I will give it unto thy seed. I have caused thee to see it with thine eyes, but thou shalt not go over thither. Verse 5, So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab, over against Beth Peor, but no man knoweth of his sepulcher unto this day. Then it goes on to say Moses was 120 when he died. He was 120 years old when he died. So that's, that's uh, chapter 34 in uh, verses 4 down through 6. This is when, when the was not dead. Yeah, his strength was, he was as strong as he was. He was not weakened at all. He was not sickly. He wasn't had no problems. He had his full strength, had his full mind. And God caused him to see from that mountaintop and in, that, in, the, in the place, caused him to see. I believe he gave him 
really, really zoom vision that he could not just see trees and water, but that he could actually see the land and how good it was and every part of it. He said, I have caused thee to see it with thine eye. And then I believe God put his face down and said, but thou shalt not cross over. Moses died. And God buried him. He didn't just let him die and lay there. He picked him up and he buried him. I think that's awesome. Verse 10 of 34 pence of course, but I've seen him face to face because it says that there were rope. There arose not a prophet in yeah. Israel like unto Moses, who the Lord knew face to face. Yeah. So I mean, literally. There was nobody else that the Lord knew face to face like Moses. Think about how special that that is. That's awesome. Okay, that's just awesome. <coughs> so um, while we were in Exodus chapter 33, we'll pull out a couple of truths here concerning the meaning of the veil. It was absolutely unapproachable holiness of God. There was absolutely ungodliness of man and, and undeserved goodness and the grace of God. But he says, you'll stand upon the rock, you'll be placed in a rock, and you'll be covered by the rock. Amen. He's going to cover you. He's going to cover you up. You know, we, all, we often sing that. Um, he hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock. And covered, co covers me there with his hand. That's what that's about. Amen. He just picks you up, puts you there, and covers you, and hides you. Right. So that's a that was a great, great song, great, great account in the scriptures. So first, we want to see that sin separates us from God. He said, "Thou canst not see my face." In verse twenty. Uh, for there shall no man see me and live. He is absolute holy. He's absolutely holy. First Timothy 6.16 Who only hath immortality dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. Even Jesus himself took the form of man, but he could not, he could not show us the face of God. He could not be the face of God because no one could see the face of God and live. Right? So even Jesus, when he was here, he had to take those attributes so that we could even look on him. Because what, what good would it do to have him come and we can't even look to him? Right? He's not here. He's not here to condemn or destroy. He was here to seek and to save that which is lost. So he became like us. We it also establishes that we are absolutely sinful in Habakkuk 1:13. Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. Wherefore lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously, and holdest thy tongue? when the wicked devour the man that is more righteous than he. We see secondly that the Savior that, recon, uh, the Savior that reconciles us to God in verse 21 and 22 uh, in uh, um, Exodus 33. It says, There is a place by me, thou shalt stand upon the rock, and goes on to say, And there shall come to pass while my glory passeth by, and I will put thee in the cliff of the rock and will cover thee with my hand when I pass by. God loves us. He loves us. In John, 1 John 4, 9, And in this was manifested the love of God towards us because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. That's what it was all about. His life. Obey me and live. Choose me to live. Choose life that it might be well with thee. And in the Son is life. God sent us life through Jesus Christ. And that's what you have to know. In order to get to the presence of God, you have to live. The only way you can live is to go through life. To be born, to live. If we're not alive, then we're dead. We're dead in trespasses and sins. 
but were quickened and made alive through Jesus Christ, through the veil. And he brings us to the presence yeah. of God. So great. And of course, uh, you couldn't uh, not mention uh, that Christ died for us in Romans 5, 8, but God committed his love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He died for us. And that's another reason. We just read that God couldn't look on sin. He can't look on sin. And that's why when the Lord became sin in his body on the tree, that God had to turn his back and not look down on the Son. And that at that time, because he became sin, that he can't look at it. Christ intercedes for us. We've talked a little bit about that already. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's Hebrews 7.25. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God, unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. So it even tells us and reiterates us that we get to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Over and over, you must come to Jesus before you get to God. He's in the veil. Even in the Old Testament, we find where you've got to go through Jesus Christ in order to get into the holies of holies in the presence of the Lord God. We see it all through the scriptures. And it's backed up from cover to cover. That Jesus is the only way. We have to go through Him. That's where we get eternal life from. Thirdly, that the grace that reveals God to us. Verse 19, I will make all my goodness pass before thee. We see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 4, 6. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness and shine in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. How can we know the Father without knowing Him? If we know the Father, we definitely know Him because we had to go through Him to get to the Father. Right? You have to know Him in order to get to the Father. We see the grace of God and the salvation of Christ as well. Colossians 3.3 3, For you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. Your life is hid just like Moses was put up in that rock and hid, hidden, completely covered and hidden by God Himself to protect Him. Our life is the same way. We're in His hand, and my, I am in my Father's hand, and no man can pluck them out of my Father's hand. So you imagine Jesus has you, and then God <coughs> has you hid in Christ. And no man's going to get through there. That was a barrier that protected Moses because he would not be able to see it would have been so dark by God covering him in the cliff of that rock. He wouldn't have even been able to see. You know, you've all been in a, a place that was so dark you couldn't see your own hand in front of your face. That's the way it was. God covered him. He couldn't even see the hand of God. He covered him. Our life is hid with Christ in God. That's where it is. That's where our life is. And isn't it awesome that no man can get, no man, no demon in hell can get through the hand of God to get to your life. Because it's hid. It's hidden with Christ in God. How awesome is that? We also see the goodness of God in the provision and protection of of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Psalm chapter 107, verse 8 and 9, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for His goodness and for His wonderful works to the children of men. For He satisfieth the longing soul and filleth the hungry soul with goodness. 
that you're so longing that he fills it? Is your soul hungry? Is it thirsty? He satisfies it. He takes care of what no one else could ever take care of. You eat, you'll, you'll be hungry again. You drink, you'll be thirsty again. It's a continual thing. God takes care of all of us. And we're, we're going to be filled. It says, blessed are they that hunger and thirst and that will, they will be filled. He satisfies the longing soul and filleth the hungry and the soul with goodness. He fills it with goodness. Nothing bad. It's good. It's really good. That's why the best meals that we can ever have are the spiritual ones. Because those are the ones that last. Those are the ones that are the most satisfying. You know what? I've had, I'll tell you right now, I've had some really good meals. I, I, obviously I have. Look at me. <laughs> I've had plenty of great meals. But none, I mean, after a while it just wears off and now you just have a full stomach and all you want to do is just go to sleep and you know, that's, that's all good, it's fine. But I tell you what, when you get a good spiritual meal, it, it almost, it, it's almost enough to where you don't want a physical one. I've gotten so full of the Word before that I wasn't even hungry physically. How can you how can you digest all this good stuff and have anything else go on? It, it like it supersedes even your own natural your own natural wants and needs because it's just so satisfying. And you just revel as you think about the goodness of God. And your soul is filled with the goodness of God. How awesome He is. How tender He is. How He protects us. How He provides for us. All the things that He does for us. It's all the goodness of God that we're filled with. And that is satisfying to the soul. It's full. It's food for the soul. Right? And that's just good all around. But Jesus Christ is our veil. Rent at Calvary, who opened to us the very presence of God. He had already come, sacrificed Himself, and that is what was needed to take the barrier away between us and God, that we could come directly into His presence. The Lord Jesus Christ is why we have God in our midst. How awesome is that? He is our veil. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, how we love you. How we're